Daily Detroit is brought to you by the community. Support our work at patreon.com slash daily Detroit. From a very snowy north end of Detroit, I'm Jer Stays. And I'm Sven Gustafson. This is your Daily Detroit, recorded on Tuesday, November 12th, 2019. So, Jerry, man, how about that uh, That snow? Seems like we got a little. Yeah, it's like a urban Christmas card out the back behind me with that window. We are digging out after what was a record-breaking snowstorm on Monday. Torrential. Tor- Is that a word for snow? Do those, do those go together? You're the English major. I don't see why not. All right. Well, we did get snowfall records. They were broken for the day and the month. We got 9.2 inches Monday night here in the city. That's more than double the previous record set back in 1984, and it obliterated, that's a great word, the previous record for the entire month of November, which was 6.2 inches in 1925. You remember 1925? No, I only know one person alive that's like 103. Man, well, I will tell you, uh, nine point two. I mean, I didn't get you know my ruler out or anything, but I could see it piled up on the uh, the banister of my back patio in Ferndale, where I live, and it was as tall as I've ever seen it. I mean, I've lived there for fifteen years almost, and this is the tallest I've ever seen it. It was also because in fifteen years I've shoveled a lot of snow from you know I don't have a snowblower or anything. I just have my trusty shovel, and you and are the snowblower. I that's what they call me. Uh, but that was the heaviest snow i have ever shoveled i mean i'm not kidding you like that it was really wet heavy snow i would sink my shovel into there and pull it up and try to dump it and most of the snow would remain stuck packed to the to the shovel itself like it was it was a chore to get that stuff so how so how about the kidlets because i mean they're off school today okay Uh, i had to beat a hasty retreat out of the house because it was crazy you know uh, hopefully they went sledding or something to burn off some steam. You know, I would just point out though that this is the second year in a row. My wife pointed this out that that uh, last year in November we got an early snowfall like this, no, nowhere near as much snow, but uh, there were still. I mean, I'm looking behind you. The tree in between us and the house next door still has green leaves on it. That happened again. That happened last year, just like this. The leaves were still on the trees before the first snow fell. It made a real mess for like curbside leaf pickup in cities like Ferndale that have that kind of thing. I, it's crazy, man. I, You know, Mother Nature's confused. Yeah, for sure. And we're in for more cold temperatures dropping into single digits overnight. So uh, as a person I used to work with used to say, cuddle alert. So WXYZ had a pretty interesting report about a landowner who was forgiven more than a million bucks in back taxes, fees, and fines he owes the city. It was in trade for land for that new Fiat Chrysler plant we've mentioned more than a few times on the podcast. I think you should check out the piece by Ross Jones and Allie Gross. They did a great job. We'll have a link in the show notes. But the TLDR of it is that not only did the city forgive all of those back issues, but this guy, Michael Kelly and his company, Detroit Property Exchange, well, they allegedly are at it again. This TV station showed an example of a home that was purchased on the east side, and uh, I'll put purchased in air quotes as it's one of those complicated land contract deals. This guy literally made them sign a land contract and a lease, which is just confusing and it's messy. And the thing is, this house is not habitable. A bunch of repairs that were promised are not getting done. It was just crazy. Their scripted story online uh, talked about others because they did a little bit more in-depth reporting beyond just the the newscast. And I mention this because that FCA plant required a ton of quick real estate maneuvering in just about 90 days to assemble the land needed to make this FCA deal happen. The city stands by the deal, saying it was good for the city. But I wanted to mention here, Sven, and especially to you, because we've asked questions about this one before. DT Energy swapped riverfront land for this, making some of those areas parking lots in the future for new cars. Like, uh, there's a lot of things happening with this deal. And we're finding out more and more the farther away we get it from being executed. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and it's it's yet another example of like how eager political our, our political leaders are in Detroit and in Michigan, just more broadly, but especially in Detroit to sort of give away the farm for big ticket development proposals, right? Like another uh, great example is uh, District Detroit. You know, the Illich's uh, promised redevelopment of 50 square blocks of the Lower Cass Corridor around the Little Caesars Arena. 
Well, I want to put a pin in that one. We're going to come back to that in a minute, actually, as yeah. there are new developments. But I ask, are, are we in a situation where there's no better option? I don't know. I mean, elected officials just seem, uh, and in this case, I think, you know, the Duggan administration, Mike Duggan, mayor, is so eager to point to, you know, development wins. Like, look what we got here in the city. You know, this is going to be great. We got a new factory opening up. They're going to make, you know, a new uh, Jeep SUV out on the east side of Detroit. It's great. But like, what are we losing that? I mean, you know, we talked, you mentioned the, uh, the DTE land swap to like basically make room for parking lots, you know, so that there's going to be parking lots going all the way up almost to the riverfront uh, for that, you know, which sounds terrible. Well, and here's the thing that gets me. I I know that deals have to get done, but the lack of transparency is what's getting me. These things seem to be dribbling out over time. And that like, if it's one thing, if you're going to make a deal and say, this is what we need to do and stand by it. It's another thing. If we just seem to continually find little bits over and over that just kind of get right. dribbled well, out. And in this case, you know, apparently making sweetheart deals with, I hate to use the word slumlord, but it seems kind of like a slumlord in this case. Like this guy's clearly taking advantage of his tenants or the people that he's selling homes to on land contract, which is a totally shady, you know, uh, under-regulated kind of area of real estate. I don't think we want to make people's like these lives easier in this town like you know we we've we've got enough sort of bad apples in in uh, as you know real estate holdings here in the city of detroit well i would not mention here another thing that happened over the last week is that it looks like detroit's rental registration program has basically failed it just wasn't adopted and and they could not push it through landlords did not want to do it it would have required all rentals in the city to be registered and tracked but the problem here is is that no Nobody would like people were refusing to sign up. Uh, it was difficult to enforce. I believe there was even like a court issue involved with getting this to enforce. Like we literally can't even regulate our landlords like a normal city would. All right. As promised, circling back to the district Detroit. Yesterday, the Detroit Greenways Coalition on Twitter shared that the Illich family is proposing to convert Henry and Sprout Streets which are right around the district of Detroit, into an easement. That means they would control it and could convert it into a private street. The Greenways Coalition also asked whether people thought this was a good idea, and, well, they got a lot of uh, reaction, including from yours truly. Uh, that's true. A couple of notes here. First off, although the map shows lots of properties of years past that the Greenways Coalition shared, nowadays Henry runs just south of the arena, and it's de facto shut down except for specific arena traffic. Uh, this would make it official. It would also make it a four-block-long area from the freeway to Temple with the closure of Sprout Street, uh, which is open to through traffic currently, but I recently drove through there a couple of times, and you it's very difficult. There's no sidewalks. There is no... It's basically a construction zone. It's very hard to navigate. And basically, they're looking to shut this all down and bring it under their control. And as I said, it would make four blocks between the Fisher Freeway and Temple that would basically be like a Little Caesars Arena zone. Mega block. Yeah, mega block. What do you think? Like I said in reaction to the Detroit Greenways Coalition, and shout out to our friend Todd Scott for alerting us to this, but you know, the, the city at this point really should be in no frame of mind to do the Illich family any favors at this point, you know, because they have missed deadline after deadline after deadline to develop, basically follow up on their plans, their stated plans to develop the District of Detroit. The District of Detroit is a bunch of parking lots and Little Caesars Arena. That's well, what Kirk it is. Kirk Pinho today talked about uh, the fact from that Crane's Detroit business. Yeah, from Crane's Detroit uh, business said that they are not that the city and the DGC are not answering questions about a bunch of things involving this project. That which the, sounds the, the, the curtain of secrecy has fallen down. Which again, make whatever deals you're going to do. Let's be transparent about it. Yeah, going back to the uh, the earlier X Y Z story about the you know the the landlord on the east side and everything, real estate development in this town just seems broken, right? I mean- Oh, it is completely broken. John Gallagher from the Free Press had an interesting piece uh, today or yesterday talking about how, you know, Detroit is constantly so focused on the big picture developments, you know, like the Rensen and the new um, uh, Stephen A. Ross U of M Innovation Center on the, on the old fail jail site. 
Gallagher in this case was talking about like you know favoring sort of smaller projects that that boost urban vitality and walkability and things like that. But his larger point is very, I think, apt that we're so focused in this region on landing huge you know mothership developments that like are going to you know get headlines and and win you know plaudits and everything oh district detroit 50 there's a ribbon cutting for a politician to stand next to but but and it earns you know goodwill uh at least for a time for the illiches i'd say they've kind of burned through that pretty well now but but yeah well, but to me, so this the, the reason why I think you're seeing all these bigger projects is that fundamentally the economics of doing business in the city are broken. Yeah. Like fundamentally, like I was just in Hamtramck with that episode yesterday mm-hmm. and they've been focusing on the small stuff to make improvements over time. Things are still not quote unquote done, but they're making improvements and they're doing it through small projects here in the city of Detroit between your high taxes, your high insurance rates. Everything else, like it is really hard as a small business. It is hard to do something without massive subsidies and incentives. I was talking to a, one of my con- business contacts for that that does development, and they're just flummoxed because there's nowhere they can go without a city of Detroit stamp of approval. And the reality is, is that if you're a smaller person, if you're a million, two million, those kind of smaller developments you're not going to get as much attention because you're not as big and you don't have the government's hand to guide you. Maybe we need to, you know, change the fundamental system. So the tax rates, the residential and the commercial tax rates aren't so stupid high and actually make a system that works instead of handing out tax breaks. Yeah. For projects, pie in the sky projects, uh, not to say the Fiat Chrysler plan is pie in the sky, but, but at this point, district Detroit certainly fits that bill. There's bad news for booze hounds like you, Jer. Mm. <laughs> Republic National Distributing is one of just three companies authorized to distribute liquor here in Michigan. The company recently moved into a new warehouse in Livonia and says it's been plagued by software issues that have affected deliveries of booze to bars, restaurants, and retail stores. That's led to shortages of liquor at some establishments, and some say the problems could persist into the busy holiday season. That means no brandy for uh, Christmas, Jer, I guess. Well, no brandy for our uh, engineer, Randy. The Michigan Liquor Control Commission is even stepping in and says it plans to hold the company accountable for how it plans to fix the situation and help licensees keep their shelves and bars stocked. It noted that any downturn in liquor sales due to the problem also affects the state's finances as the sole wholesaler of spirits. That's an industry... The state valued last year at nearly $1.5 billion. Cranes reports that the new Livonia facility represents a consolidation of Republic's warehouses in Grand Rapids and Brownstown Township, which is downriver. The head of the company's Michigan operations told the publication they expect things to improve starting next week when they begin moving some of its business back to Brownstown Township to deal with the high volume and orders for the holiday season. The company has also reportedly hired temporary workers and brought in employees from other states to deal with the logjam. Michigan's booze and beer system is a mess. It's been a mess for a long time. I'm sensing a theme to today's episode, Jer. Yes, there is a theme. Things that are a mess for 500, please. <laughs> well, because the thing is with with Michigan, like here's something interesting, and you wouldn't may not know this unless you're a craft drinker or you're into like kind of like niche spirits as myself and engineer Randy. One of the things is, is that there are a bunch of spirits you cannot get in Michigan. You can't even get them at bars because you have to sell a certain amount of them. Otherwise, the state literally doesn't let you carry them. This also limits a lot of independent creators, even those who, you know, they follow all the rules. They do all the the safety precautions. If you don't sell a certain amount, they take you off the list. And if you're not on, quote, the list, you're done. You can't sell in the state for another year. There's a bunch of other issues with um, beer, which is something we touched on with uh, Eastern Market, Eastern Brewing, Market Company. Brewing Company. Yep. The, Daniel Barch was yep. on the show earlier talking about that. That's a D- fascinating Dane thing. Dane Barched. Dane, Dane, sorry. And uh, to me, it's something where, yet again, we have like a bunch of regulation that doesn't make sense in the modern era. Like, I get it. After Prohibition, you don't want the mob to touch this stuff. But like, this isn't the world we live in today. Like, I know a lot of distributors that would like to do things and spirits would like to grow. And a lot of people who create beverages that are local, that there's no viable business plan for them here. Yeah. They literally move to other states because of our overregulation. 
The Pistons finally have both all-star forward Blake Griffin and new signing Derrick Rose back and healthy, but it wasn't enough to help the team last night. Detroit lost the second game in a row, 120-114 to 114 to the Minnesota Timberwolves. The Pistons fall to 4-7 and seven early on in the season, and joining us to talk about that is our sports correspondent, Fletcher Sharp. Uh, Fletcher, are the Pistons clearly struggling early on? Are they really this bad, or is it just a case where injuries have kind of compiled and hurt them? Injuries have kind of reared their ugly head at like the wrong moment, and as you mentioned, both those players being back, they play Miami tonight. And they will not have neither of those players. So that game could get very, very ugly very quickly. Neither of those players available. Uh, why? They're not playing in bo- on both and back to backs if they can help it. I see. But as their record shows, um, they've been doing, they've held the water pretty well without Blake Griffin, which is kind of impressive. Derrick Rose has kind of looked closer to his older MVP form before his knees blew up. The team is pretty solid. It really just depends on defensive intensity and uh, making shots. Luke Kennard cannot be the only person to make outside shots. It has to come from somewhere. Um, Tony Snell's been doing a pretty good job, another signing by them. The other Morris brother, uh, Markeef, Pistons had Marcus before, he's been doing all right. Their big issue for me, and I hate to say this because when they got him, I loved him, Thon Maker has really, really regressed as a basketball player. I'm not really even certain he knows how to play the sport of basketball at this point. Uh, I know it's kind of a semantic stat, plus minus stat, but like for those who aren't aware, the plus minus stat is it indicates how how well you impact the game in the score. So you could literally do nothing. But if you're on the court and you have a large plus stat it means your team outscores the other team while you're on the court. That's good. It means you're doing something good. Likewise, if you're putting up 100 points a game, but you have a massive negative stat, you're doing something that's harming your team. And Thon Maker's negative stat is like one of the worst in the NBA right now. That's going to really hurt your team. And the problem has been, uh, with Blake Griffin being out, he's getting more minutes. He's probably getting more minutes than Christian Wood, which is kind of surprising because Christian Wood has really come on and provided a spark that I did not expect the Pistons to have in him. And I don't I, I don't see practice, so obviously I can't speak to that. But for some reason, Thon Maker is getting a lot more minutes than he should. And when Dwayne Casey was asked about it last night, he tried to play it off like, I don't see what the problem is. Thon's struggling? Who knew? Uh, meanwhile, Andre Drummond is playing well and putting up good uh, numbers. So do you see it as a case where, you know, as Rose and Griffin hopefully kind of get healthy and back up to speed, the team will hopefully gel and, and start to perform better? Yeah, because Andre's numbers he's putting up uh, while he's getting a few more touches with Rose and Blake being out. Most of his points come from like rebounds and putbacks. And he's really there to, like, grab rebounds. And he's averaging almost 20 rebounds a game, which is, like, unheard of. I saw some really crazy stat that, like, he, right now, I think is get closing in on career rebounds as many as Shaq has. Which, thinking about that is, like, nuts. But also, the game has changed so much since then, so I kind of got to take that in perspective. But it lets you know that, like, kind of like how Dwight Howard was when people were like, oh, he's okay, but he's putting up monster numbers in the middle. We are very hard on Andre Drummond, as we should be, because he's currently the best player, at least top two player on this roster. But, like, he's putting up historic, meteoric numbers. Um, We've not really seen big men average 20 and 20, and he's very close to doing that. So while there are some questions about his effort last night, there was a play in particular where he had a chance for two defensive rebounds, let the ball bounce out for two missed shots, got the rebound, dribbled it up the court, and then threw a very awful pass that got turned over for a layup. There's some commitment issues. There's some question about his intensity. He's a really great player. And uh, if he were to leave, kind of like how with the Lions, when we didn't have Matt Stafford, the Lions looked horrible. And they've looked bad before, but they looked even worse. If we were to lose Andre Drummond to, like, a contract and have him go somewhere else, the Pistons would look horrible. And people need to, like, understand that. And while they don't look great right now, they look a lot worse without him in the middle. All right. Uh, well, Fletcher, let's shift gears. Uh, Maybe the off season, but nevertheless, there is some soccer news to run down here in the Detroit area. And for a change, it does not involve Detroit City FC, but we've got uh, three teams from the Detroit area making moves to new leagues. Uh, Oakland County FC uh, has said it's moving up to USL League Two next season from the United Premier Soccer League. Meanwhile, Carpathia FC, which is a club based in Sterling Heights but playing in Auburn Hills, it's going to move up to the NPSL, which uh, Detroit City FC is leaving next season. And then uh, Sporting Detroit Soccer Club moving into the UPSL, I guess taking 
Oakland County FC's place. I said uh, this on Twitter the other day, Fletcher, that uh, U.S. soccer just seems to be like a perpetual game of musical chairs. Yeah, it's it's interesting because in the off season you don't have this in like Europe or South America where teams just move leagues like willy nilly. It's not like a card shuffle. Well, I guess they move leagues in terms of promotion and relegation, which is something American soccer does not have. But it's equal parts good, equal parts bad. You have people moving from league to league, and like you have people moving from one league and saying, this league we're moving to is great. This league, remo- the league we moved from is not so great. They have their issues here and here. Then you have a team moving from the league that they moved to to the league that they moved from, and they're like, yeah, this league is great. They have this. And it's just like you hear all these things about all these different leagues. and it's just Grass is always greener, right? Yeah. I will say Oakland County FC, props to them. A little surprised they moved to USL League 2. Um, as USL League Two is affiliated with with Major League Soccer, the fee to get into that league is a little bit higher than the NPSL. I did not know Oakland County FC had backers like that, but if they do, shouts out to them. That's great that they're financially able to move into that league. Uh, for those who don't know, USL League Two is a bit more of a developmental league, so it's more focused on having your players ready to play. The NPSL, while it's still a development, developmental league, is more of a league that's like teams stay here to like build identities and like more homey. That was the difference between uh, Detroit city FC and Flint city bucks was Detroit city FC had a really great team, but they had more of a homey identity where it's like, you come to keywords, you come play Flint city bucks were like, we could play you in the middle of the street. Doesn't matter as long as our players are getting better. Um, which is why Carpatia opted to move to the MPSL. For those who are not aware, they are have rich German history. Uh, they've been around for a very long time. So much to the point to where they don't really have as many German players as they had when they first started out, but they still have a few. They're trying to rebuild their youth team by joining the NPSL and getting more of a homey feel. And I can say this now because it's out. They, their owner turned and smiled to me when I went to go cover their event. He's like, yeah, it would have been great to play in front of you know Detroit City FC's fans and to play like against a really talented team like AFC and Arbor, but they would have beaten the crap out of us, and we we're happy that they're not the league anymore. <laughs> He's like, honestly, five out of five times it would have ended poorly for us because they have great coaches, they have great players, not to say anything about our players, but they have avenues that we do not have. So, like, I do not want to face a team like that. So coming into the NPSL now, I think we have a chance. And finally, Sporting Detroit, uh, their head coach is Detroit City FC midfielder, former FC Sparta Michigan midfielder, uh, George Chamakoff. They competed in the, MP- in the MPSL, the Michigan Premier Soccer League, which is really just a lot of local clubs like Livonia City. Uh, that's all I can really think of right now. The UPSL kind of fits to your point about having high turnover. They are the largest fourth division league with like over 200 teams. But like every season, every off season, they lose like 15 teams and gain like 30. So like it's just kind of like musical chairs. Who's leaving? Who's coming back? Who's going where? So uh, I hope Sporting Detroit, uh, who actually are playing in Detroit, their home field is going to be on Kilgore in Detroit. Um, so they are the only team, soccer team in Michigan that play in Detroit. They are Detroit's team. Good for them. I wish them luck. Uh, the UPSL is a very, very interesting league. Um, it's very chaotic. Hopefully they can do well and put on for the state. Because uh, Michigan has not really done that. They haven't done poorly in the UPSL, but they have not done great in terms of representing the Midwest. So hopefully they can do a much better job. If you're looking for some former DCFC players who have left the team with Detroit City going professional, here's some news. A few of their players will be playing for Carpatia and maybe Sporting Detroit. I know for a fact former captain Dave Edwardson uh, has played for Carpatia in the past. And at the unveiling event, when they came down to take pictures with the players, David Edwardson was there front and center taking pictures with the players and the owners. So I assume he'll probably be suiting up for them this MPS, MPSL season. So if you're looking for some former Detroit City players who might not have been on the same level as going pro, but they're still players who warmed your heart, check out Carpatia, check out Sporting Detroit this summer. You'll get to see some of those former players. All right, good stuff. Fletcher Sharp covers the Pistons and soccer in Michigan for us and tell us Detroit. Fletcher, thanks for uh, bringing us up to speed on everything. For sure. Thanks for having me. That'll do it for today's show, friends. Thanks so much for listening. If you want to help us, you can become a member on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash daily Detroit for as low as a buck a month. 
independent media requires independent funding to succeed, after all. Yep. Well, with that, I'm Jer Stays. And I'm Sven Gustafsson. Take care of each other, and we'll see you around Detroit. Come high snow or low temperatures. Runoff.